How to avoid being arrested in a drug investigation. I want to talk for a few minutes about drug investigations, and they can really range anywhere from simple possession, like possession of marijuana, all the way up to uh, delivery and manufacturing of drugs, which literally can hold up to a first degree felony life in prison. So I think it's important to understand some of the concepts and some of the things that the police are looking for in order to establish probable cause to arrest you for a drug offense. Let's start with the most basic one. The one where most people will find themselves in a situation if they're hanging around other people, and especially if they're not using drugs, is a simple possession charge. So let's say you're in a car and there's drugs found in the car. How could the police somehow arrest you for possession? Well, the most simple concept on this is to understand what possession means. Possession means to intentionally or knowingly exercise care, custody, or control is what the law says. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. It's a little subjective because the way the police look at it and the law looks at it is they are looking to see wherever drugs are found, they're going to look to see who is within the wingspan of that drug. They are trying to affirmatively link a particular person to that drug, okay, to the illegal drug. And so there's all these other concepts I could talk about. I could talk about joint possession. I could talk about whether or not You know, you've got multiple people here actually within the wingspan. Maybe they both knew about it, but it is important to understand this. You don't have to own the drugs. You just have to exercise care, custody, or control over those drugs. So you can understand where there can be some issues here. When you're looking at whether or not someone exercised their care, custody, or control, you have to also tie in. So you've got care, custody, or control plus criminal intent. How do they establish criminal intent? Well, this is a little harder. So I'm going to give you some I'm going to give you some tactics here to do this. And a lot of this should be common sense, but I see people continuing to mess this up over and over again. Let's say you find yourself in a car. Let's say you get pulled over, maybe you're a passenger, you're riding with your buddy, and as you get pulled over on the side of the road, the cop comes up, begins to ask questions, claims, "Hey, I smell marijuana. The smell uh the burnt odor of marijuana in this car. I need you guys to get out. I'm going to search the car." Now, immediately, you're kind of looking at it going, what's going on? There shouldn't be any big issue here because I don't have any drugs. But they get out of the car and what do they find? They find drugs in the center console, okay? Now, if you're in the passenger seat, that is technically within your wingspan. So the police are immediately going to say, you know, we're going to arrest you. We need to figure out what's going on. The only thing we're missing now is criminal intent. Did you do this intentionally or knowingly? Because I want to be real clear about this. Merely being at the scene of a crime is not in and of itself a crime. So it's not because you're just sitting there and there were drugs under your chair or sitting in the center console and you had no idea where they were there, that should not be enough for them to be able to arrest or convict you. Now, in fairness, I see people arrested for this all the time and it's usually because they open their mouth. So principle number one, if you find yourself in the middle of a possession uh, investigation, keep your mouth closed. It is very common for the police to question everyone that's present at the scene in order to see if they can start pitting someone's statement against another. So remember this, all all the officer is looking for is one person to admit that it was theirs. And this happens constantly. And by the way, police can lie to you. They could come over and say, hey man, I was just over here off the side of the road with your buddy and the driver already told me it was you. He already told me it was your drugs. So look, you know, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not, but he's already ratted you out and that's all we need in order to arrest you. So why don't you really tell me what's going on? That will many times lead people to turn around and say, oh man, what are you talking about? He said it was me. It's not mine. It's his. Oh, but you knew it was there? Well, I mean, yeah, I knew it was there, but it's not my drugs. That's the number one thing I see people do is they'll say, it's not my stuff, but I knew it was there. And what does that do? Remember, the police never have to prove ownership of the drugs. They only have to prove knowledge of it, that you intentionally or knowingly exercise care, custody, or control, which means you didn't have to own it. But you knew it was there and you exercised that control over it. So that alone could be enough for the police to choose to arrest you. So if you do get pulled over and the police start asking you questions, remember, do not answer their questions. Simply say, officer, I exercise my right to remain silent. That's it. Don't say anything else. Because otherwise, what you're going to find is the police are on a fishing expedition. If everybody keeps their mouth closed then most of the time, they're not sure if they're going to have enough evidence to convict anyone, much less arrest them. But invariably, someone opens their mouth. And here's the number one the number one big one that I see, boyfriend and girlfriend in the car, right? Or some good buddy, best friend. Well, they feel bad because their best friend is supposedly now being arrested. The cop will say, hey man, if you don't tell me what's going on, I'm going to arrest your girlfriend. So what does the guy say? 
all right, man, yeah, it's my drugs, because they don't want the girlfriend getting arrested, even though the police may have not had enough evidence to do anything based upon no one opening their mouth. Number two, do not consent to a search. Now, this makes sense whether you're being pulled over for a traffic offense and they want to search you, or you're talking about being at your home. Now, I want you to understand you say, now, wait a minute, if they come to my home or the property, they already have a search warrant, I have to consent, right? No, no, no. The only thing that you can do, and what I say by that is that you have to allow them to search the whole property. That's true. If they have a search warrant, they can search, but you can absolutely tell them you do not consent to any area that's not within the search warrant, and you want to make sure and let them know you exercise your right to refuse a search for anything they don't have probable cause for. This will equip your lawyer to be able to challenge any search that exceeds the scope of the warrant based upon the probable cause given to the judge. Okay, now let's talk about this for a second. Let's say the police come and they start using many suggestive techniques. It's not always just saying, hey man, let me search your car. What they'll do is they'll walk up and they'll go, man, what's that in your back seat? Let me take a look at it. Or they'll say, hey man, listen, I just pulled you over. Pop your trunk for a second. I see a problem with your tail light. I want to make sure it's good. I'll check it out for you. These are the kind of things that they do. They don't just flat out tell you, I need consent to search your vehicle. They'll just try to act like they're rushing through a normal conversation with you, wanting to check something out, acting like they're curious. Don't fall for it. Say, officer, I do not consent to the search of my vehicle, or I do not consent to the search of the property. Now, what if the property is not yours? A little bit different situation. If you're the passenger in the car, you don't have what's called legal standing to allow the, to tell them that they cannot search the vehicle. So one of the things, same thing, if you're in someone else's house or apartment, if it's not yours, you really don't have the ability to tell them they can't search. It's based upon who has the legal standing and whose property right it is that they can tell them not to search. It's important to understand the distinction. What if the police continue to hold you and they don't have any really legal basis whatsoever to arrest you? Now, I see this happen all the time. After some period of time, particularly you're on the side of the road, one of the things to do is to ask the officer, officer, am I free to leave? Because I've seen officers commiserating in the back. They're talking to their buddies. They're over. They're literally on their microphone trying to talk to, uh, talk, talk to the station to find out if you have any active warrants or other things. It's important after a certain period of time, especially if they're just giving you a traffic ticket, to ask if you're free to leave. Because a police officer cannot hold you any longer than is reasonably necessary to finish that traffic ticket right? Same thing if they're at your home. They can't just hold you hostage in that position forever. It's important to ask the question if you're free to leave because it forces the officer to say yes or no. And it's important for your lawyer because if you ask and he says, no, you're not free to leave. And if they've held you for an unreasonable period of time, particularly if they're waiting for a drug dog, now your attorney can go into court and contest the fact it was very clear you wanted to leave, you were attempting to exercise your opportunity to leave, and the officer was holding you beyond the scope of what he was legally allowed to do. Okay, let's transition to the next thing now. What if, and I've had a lot of my viewers ask, well, what happens if you find yourself being pulled over and now all of a sudden you see an officer claiming, hey man, listen, I, you know, I think you've been involved in drug dealing or manufacturing. I think you're more than just possessing here. How do you deal with that situation? I want to break down a very common scenario that I see people finding themselves getting tangled within the web of the police, particularly narcotics. So narcotics officers use this technique all the time. What they will do is they'll hang out in a known drug house or a place that they think drugs were purchased or you know, maybe just they know people frequent a particular area and they'll look for some small town person. And they do this a lot with people that, that purchase marijuana, um, but even smaller amounts of other types of drugs is they'll wait for them to come out of the house. They'll follow them. They'll find some ticky tack reason why they missed a traffic violation or they violated the law. One of the biggest ones I see all the time is they'll look and they'll say, oh, hey, you Pat, you stopped over the crosswalk or you failed to signal your turn within 50 feet of your turn. Everybody violates that traffic violation, but they're looking for any reason to pull you over. And the moment they pull you over, what do they do? They walk up to the car and they start saying, hey, man, how are we doing? Uh, where were you headed from? And they want to start asking you questions. Now, remember, don't answer these questions any more than you have to. You know you have to give them your driver's license. You have to identify from that perspective. If you choose to roll down your, your, uh, your window just a little bit to hand the license, you only identify based upon what your state laws require. You don't provide any other information beyond that. They want you to engage in small talk. Because then the next thing they're going to do, even if you're quiet, many times they'll say, 
Yeah, listen, man, I think I smell the burnt odor of marijuana in your vehicle. I'm going to need you to step out. Now, I am going to tell you, in many states where marijuana is legal, this doesn't work. There are some states that have ruled that the burnt odor, the smell of the burnt odor of marijuana is not sufficient to establish probable cause. But if you are in a state where marijuana is illegal in any regard, even if it's a citation of any sort, that could give the officer enough uh, probable cause to be then to then be able to force you to be able to get out of the vehicle because they claim they now want to search the car. Okay. Now let's say that happens and they find drugs in the vehicle. Well, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to put in what I call, they're going to put the squeeze on you. Okay. And I see this happen. All of a sudden you'll see guys in plain clothes show up, right? You had the regular officers maybe pulled you over. Then you see the plain, go, plain clothes guys show up. These are the narcotics officers. These are the guys that are out there. Many of them I've dealt with that I've seen that look like kids. I mean, literally, they look like punk kids. They look like they're in their late teens, their early 20s. And many times these are just street savvy guys that now work for the police. And now they're out there approaching. They're like, hey, man, I know you came from that uh, that that house over there. And do you know, do you know Bubba? I mean, I, I know you do. I just saw you come over from his house. Here's the deal, man. We got some drugs. Okay. So we got two options. I can either just take you in right now and we'll just book you. We're going to charge you. You're going to spend a couple of days in jail and you know, you'll just have to fight it. Do the best you can go hire a lawyer or here's what you can do. You can tell me what's going on over here. And if you tell me what's really happening and you give up three names, three people up the chain that are providing these drugs, then we'll let you work off your case. So what they will do is they will tell you that if you work with them and become essentially a confidential informant, and if you will now rat out other people that are higher up the chain, they will essentially now allow you to work off your case with this illusory promise that it's as easy as that. Just give us three names. They end up getting arrested. You're free to go. The problem with this, the narcotics officers don't always tell the truth. And many times it's not, all, it's not always that they just lie to you. It's just they have an idea in their mind that they're going to catch Al Capone or they're going to find the, the cartel by the information you provide to them, and it didn't now meet their expectations. So here's what I've seen happen. I've seen people agree to do this. They're working off the case. They got to give their cell phone number over to narcotics. Narcotics now literally has a leash around them. They're calling them saying, hey man, what have you done today? What efforts have you taken to give me the names? I need you to go over there and have a conversation with this guy. Where is he headed? What's he doing? The next thing you know, here's what takes place. Once you have done that, then now they're going to say, I need the names. And let's say you give over three names, right? And let's say maybe there's even some, you know, a buy that takes place, a controlled buy or some more really aggressive efforts that take place. And then they arrest these three individuals. I've seen this happen over and over and over again, where now the officers will say, the narcotics division will show up and say, hey man, listen, we appreciate you giving those three names, but these guys were nothing more than regular users like you. They didn't really meet the definition of what we wanted. So I hate to tell you this, man. I'm going to need three more names or only one of them was good. I need you to get me two more. And so now the terms of the deal have just been modified. You now have to keep working it off more and more and more. Why do this? Why does narcotics do this? Because they are being lazy about their investigations. They're trying to use other people to do everything they can to be able to rat out other people. So it's easier for them to get arrests. Now, look, I'm not going to sit here and talk about whether that's right or wrong. I just want you to understand if you are under investigation, for drug dealing or for possession, and they're using you in this manner, you need to understand you will be taken advantage of. So what's the solution? The solution, at least for many of the clients that I've dealt with in the North Texas area, is you want to hire an attorney. And here's what a criminal attorney can do. We've actually had instances where when that takes place, we call the narcotics division directly and we say, hey, I understand you're wanting our client to work off his cases. Why don't we meet over at my office? Let's have a conversation. And we're going to need to have a contract drafted up because we're going to list the three names. And as a result of that, you're going to agree to drop the case if those three names are provided. And here's what takes place. Now that contract, which has been memorialized, it's been agreed to, can actually be sent over to that district attorney's office so that the district attorney's office would enforce that contract based upon the specific performance provided by the person, that the, the client that's involved in the activities. Now, here's what I'll know. I'll know I'm dealing with a legitimate uh, narcotics officer who really wants to do the right thing if they're willing to do that contract. If they're not willing to do that contract, I want you to understand they have no real intent of making sure they follow through. Now, please understand, it's not like they're 
picking on people at the high end of the chain when they do this. They're always going after low, uh, you know, usually addicts, low users, and they're scaring them to death, making them think that they're somehow going to spend many, many years in prison if they don't go flip on other people that very often they don't even really know much about. So you need to understand if an officer puts what we call the squeeze on you, know what to expect. Hire an attorney. Finally, what if you suspect you're being investigated for drug investigation right now? What if you think somebody thinks you are a drug dealer or you're involved in something? Can I tell you right now, there's some things that you should be aware of. True, you know, well-trained narcotics officers, they're going to spend quite amount of, a, a large amount of time really doing the stuff you don't know anything about before you end up finding out you're going to be arrested. Most of the time, they're doing an enormous amount of surveillance. They could be checking your trash. They're talking to other associates and friends. They're going to uh, be doing, and like I talked about surveillance, they can also follow you. They can, I mean, there's all kinds of things that they've that I've seen um, narcotics officers literally following people to the point where, you know, sending other people in with a wire. And I know some of this stuff sounds like stuff that's on TV, but I do want you to understand there is a certain amount of this. If the officer does believe, particularly the DEA, if they think that someone is specifically involved in high trafficking activity, they will take these measures. In fact, there was an interesting situation where I had somebody reach out to me and said that a detective had called him and said that he was his name and his phone number was found in a known drug dealer's phone. Now, that's a strange situation. Now, all of a sudden, you have this random detective calling saying, your name was found in a drug dealer's phone. Why is it there? Well, the first thing that that guy did is he said, sir, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I refuse to answer any questions and I exercise my right to remain silent because I'm going to have my attorney reach out to you. So he exercised his Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights, but the, the individual called me and said, Jeff, what, what could happen here? Well, the first thing they could do is do what they tried to do right out of the gate is try to question you, right? So immediately they questioned him and he did the right thing. He remained silent. He exercised his right to remain silent. The second thing they did is they monitored him. He found that he looked like there was some officers that were following and he found an officer, what, what looked like an unmarked vehicle outside the front of his house that was monitoring him. And listen, that's not illegal for them to do. They can absolutely do that. They were trying to see if they could find him doing anything with this other drug dealers known associates. So they began to do that. So they could both question you. They could monitor you. They could technically, if they have enough information off the phone, they could also obtain a search warrant. And if that happens, if there is enough probable cause in that search warrant affidavit, they could come in and search the premises or other, other property that they may be able to gain access to. So it could also turn out where that's actually what happened to this individual that called us. After they searched, they found nothing. And then eventually things just kind of sat still and the investigation never continued. No action was taken. But these are the kind of things to be aware of. The smart thing that the client did is he didn't answer any questions. Because remember we talked about earlier, the officers are trying to go on a fishing expedition and try to get someone to open their mouth. Everything you say can and will be used against you. And many times it will be twisted and manipulated against you because the officer is looking for something they think they already have, which is the fact that you're guilty. Another thing that the police will do, you need to understand, do not ever trust the police. Not only can they come after you from an undercover perspective, but police officers are absolutely monitoring social media and, and those sort of things. And, and many times email communications as well. One example of this is, and many of you have probably heard, probably heard of examples of this, but someone who was under a drug investigation, what did they do? They got on social media and their pride, they just couldn't handle it. They literally, they're flashing hundred dollar bills. They've got a gun, they've got bags of dope and they're posting it because they're bragging in front of other people. What do you think the police did? They were monitoring it already. These guys didn't think that they were being investigated because they weren't smart enough to realize when they were being tailed and what was going on. So of course, all of that evidence was used against them because they were flashing it. So the reality of it is the police, in any legal way that they can, and sometimes not always legal, they are looking to do surveillance to find any information that they can to either flip someone to become a confidential informant or to ultimately attempt to arrest them for any type of drug activity. So finally, why does it even matter if you hire an attorney if you find out that you're under a drug investigation? Well, number one, now you're not going to be doing the talking with the detective. And that's really important when you do this. When an officer has already made up his mind, he thinks that you're involved in something. The most important thing you can do is to not have any interaction with that officer. Problem is, what happens if you don't have any interaction? You don't know what they're going to do. They may take whatever 
they already have and fill in the blanks for themselves, go get an arrest warrant, and now you're sitting in jail. If you hire an attorney, one of the things a lawyer can do is reach out to the detective and number one, say, hey, listen, no more reaching out to my client. He has a Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Now the officer cannot reach out to the client to have a discussion with him at all. Number two, hey, officer, if you really want to play ball and you want to know what's going on, that's fine. We can talk about these things, but you're going to have to tell me what you have. What is it that makes you think that you have anything on my client here that would lead to any type of drug arrest? Now, by the way, if that officer is not willing to share that information with me, why would we want to trust anything that he says? It's because he's already made up his mind. Now, many people say, yeah, but you as an attorney, what can you say? Because you could still get in trouble. You could have your client get in trouble. Absolutely not. Everything my client would say, it, that could be used against him in a court of law. But everything an attorney says is hearsay and cannot be used against the individual they represent. So it's really important to understand and a, 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 a criminal attorney can actually push and really try to hold that officer accountable for what's going on. And ultimately, if you have a shady cop involved in this situation, now the uh, the actual attorney is having interactions with this officer, and if it ends up going to trial, can cross-examine him on his behavior and the fact that he had already made up his mind and that it was, he was not actually an objective detective or officer. So this is really important to understand that. Now, the next thing is sometimes we can actually stop the case from moving forward at all. We've actually, once we step into that role, many times we can actually get involved with the officer and realize, well, I can't get any other, any, uh, any other information from this individual. So maybe I can't really proceed. And so now he tries to go get a search warrant or an arrest warrant. He doesn't have enough information. And now the case goes stale. There's not enough out there to proceed. We've had many of those take place as well. Finally, though, what if it does move forward? And now what if an officer ends up being arrested, you end up uh, being arrested and you're brought into jail. And as you're sitting in, in jail, they try to bring you over to be questioned. Well, you can always say that you have a right to remain silent and that you're not going to say anything. But you can also say, I have an attorney. You know, I have an attorney. I'm not saying anything till my lawyer gets here. These constitutional rights that you have can be enforced by your attorney, but just remember, these are a few of the main points you need to be aware of if you find yourself in a drug investigation.